Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Arundhati Ramanan and these are the top headlines that we're tracking for you this evening. Novartis Global CEO Vas Narasimhan says the strategic review of the listed Novartis India will determine whether it makes sense to continue running the business or find a better owner. Adds that investments into unlisted entity Novartis Healthcare will continue at a steady pace with headcounts set to rise 10% this year as Hyderabad emerges as a talent hub for the company. That's an exclusive. Stocks rise across the world after US Fed signals three potential rate cuts this year despite holding rates steady at the moment. Sensex gains over 500 points, Nifty reclaims 22,000, Midcap Index snaps a four-day losing streak recouping all the recent losses. The insurance regulator is likely to have approved new surrender value regulations that may provide some relaxations to life insurers. Final rules will be notified this week, next week. Sources say that the regulator has also approved Bima Sugam, a platform that gives customers the option to choose from multiple insurance schemes. State Bank of India files a compliance affidavit after a rebuke from the Supreme Court in the electoral bonds case. SBI says it has submitted all the details, including the unique codes that will reveal the link between buyers and the recipient political parties. Election Commission has released the data on its website. Supreme Court refuses to stay the appointment of two new election commissioners just days after the Lok Sabha polls, uh, ahead of the Lok Sabha polls, but pulls up the government of the appointment process and questions the tearing hurry when the matter is sub judice. Supreme Court lashes out at the governor of Tamil Nadu for refusing to swear in DMK leader Ponnumuri as a minister despite a stay on his conviction, gives the governor 24 hours to reinstate the minister and orders him to act as per the constitution. Supreme Court stays the government's notification on the fact-checking unit, directs the Bombay High Court to assess the impact on right to free speech. The rules empower the union government to monitor and flag alleged misinformation on the business of the centre. The Congress top brass hits out at tax notices, says the IT department has sought details from an assessment year Three dec decades ago, when Sitaram Kesri was the treasurer, Sonia Gandhi alleges that a systematic effort was underway to cripple the Congress financially. BJP President Nadda tweets that the Congress is conveniently blaming their irrelevance on financial troubles. More than 100 Palestinians killed in Israeli attacks in the last 24 hours. Overall death toll nears 32,000. U.S. unveils a new draft U.N. resolution seeking immediate ceasefire and release of hostages. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is touring the Middle East once again. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachu tells Network 18 the Supreme Court wants to set an example as an equal opportunity employer as the top court wants to send out a strong message to the society by hiring acid attack survivors and adopting artificial intelligence tools to help the visually impaired employees. Also highlights that the new Supreme Court building will be a welcoming and secure workplace for women. On the eve of the Indian Premier League, MS Dhoni steps down as the captain of Chennai Super Kings. Opening batter Rituraj Gaikwad has been named as the new skipper. The markets gained across the board after the US Federal Reserve stuck to the script and kept key interest rates unchanged. Nifty and Sensex ended over half a percent in the green, but it was the mid caps that stood out and rallied over 2%. Now, coming back to the Fed, the rates have been at two decade high since July last year. Fed Chair Jerome Powell said that inflation has eased considerably but still remains too high. But he signaled three potential rate cuts this year. Bank of England also held rates steady, but Switzerland became the first developed economy to cut rates. The move indicates that borrowing costs are set to fall broadly across advanced economies over the coming months, despite some signs of a stubborn inflation. Meanwhile, gold prices hit an all-time high after the US Federal Reserve maintained its projection of three interest rate cuts for this year. Spot gold prices surpassed the $2,200 per ounce mark. As per city, the prices could rise to $2,300 in the second half of 2024. But back home, the shares of Manipuram Finance and Muthut Finance, which provide loans against gold, surged in trade. Meanwhile, shares of Accenture tumbled more than 6% in pre-market trading. This after the company slashed its revenue growth guidance for FY24 to 1% to 3% from its previous forecast of 2% to 5%. 
For the third quarter, the company expects revenue in the range of 16 to 16.25 to 16.85 billion dollars, which is below what analysts expected. The big newsmaker this evening, Novartis Global CEO Vas Narasimhan, has said that the strategic review of the listed Novartis India will determine if it makes sense to continue running the business. However, he has clarified that the review is not due to any pricing policy in the country. Speaking to Shireen Ban, Narasimhan added that investments into unlisted entity Novartis Healthcare will continue at a steady pace with headcount set to rise 10% this year. He also added that Hyderabad is emerging as a talent hub for the company. Take a look. And we'll have to see now as we've started the strategic review what kind of offers we get. Is it better for us to continue to own this listed entity or to partner it or to, to sell it to another uh, logical buyer? So we'll see how it goes. Too soon to say at the moment. Uh, you know, has, has price control been an issue and a challenge as you operate in India on the commercial side? Because I'm given to understand that almost 30% of the brands under Novartis India are under, the, under price control. Certainly, we think the pricing environment should improve in India for innovative medicines. However, our strategic thought here is not driven by any specific pricing, uh, pricing policy. It's really much more in the long run. It, are we the logical owners of a business that's housing much more established, older medicines than our current focus? So the focus on uh, Novartis India, uh, whether it is or you believe that it's no longer a strategic fit as you look at the future, but you want to continue to double down on healthcare? Well, when you think about NHPL, which has our uh, exciting new launches, incredible medicines like our medicine Cosentix in immunology or Entresto for heart failure, we continue to invest in those new medicines and those new launches, wanting to bring them to as many people as we can within India. But then also when you think about this Hyderabad Center, our Novartis Corporate Center, which we really consider as one of the extensions of our headquarters in Basel and some of our major sites in East Hanover, this is now an 8,300 person operation in India. We're growing 10%. I would expect us to be at over 9,000 people by the end of this year. And I would foresee us to continue to grow at a double digit rate as we continue to build out capabilities in R&D, uh, in IT and data science, as well as all of our core functions. Two areas we're now looking to invest into Hyderabad are in research, so mm -hmm. basic research, which would be a significant expansion of our uh, current footprint, as well as, as expanding our U.S. marketing operations as well into India. Okay, so, uh, so you're expanding the operations at Genome Valley, which is where you have your facility, as well as expanding operations here in the facility that we're currently at. What would that typically mean in terms of incremental investments? Well, if you think about our total dollar investment right now, it's around $400 million annually we invest into India. And we estimate that actually translates into around $1.5 billion of investment into the entire ecosystem. So we would expand 10% in terms of people. I don't have the exact dollar figure, but I think you could assume that continued steady investment into India through these various footprints. And you can catch the entire conversation with Vas Narasimhan, CEO of Novartis, at 9.30 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. The insurance regulator has approved a series of proposals in its latest board meeting. It has cleared new surrender value regulations that may provide some relaxations to life insurers. Yash Jain joins us now with the details. Yash, what are these key decisions? The insurance regulators board met very recently and this board meeting was particularly very crucial and important uh, for that one agenda point which was to be discussed and an approval was expected that was around the surrender value which is paid by life insurance companies to the policy holders in case of uh, an early withdrawal of the policy what we've picked up from our sources is <coughs> i'm sorry is that the insurance regulator has approved uh, the surrender value regulations for life insurance companies. Uh, of course, a proposal on this one was released by the regulator in December 2023. That proposal spoke about increasing the surrender value by as much as two times to what it is today. And if that proposal would have come in the form that it was proposed, then insurance companies would have been able to retain uh, just 57%, uh, just 17% of the premium, which 
they collect from policy holders uh, as compared to 57% which they retain in surrender charges today. Now, what we've been given to understand is that insurance companies had put forth uh, their suggestions on surrender value. Uh, that was incorporated by the regulator and certain changes in favour of life insurance companies have been approved as a part of the final regulations on surrender value. Not just that, uh, the final regulations of surrender value are expected to be released by the regulator by as soon as early next week. What had the insurance companies suggested? One was, uh, you know, put surrender value depending on the duration of the surrender of the policy. So if a policy surrender, uh, uh, you know, is, is a longer duration, then the policy holder could be eligible for a higher surrender value. But for early surrenders, the policy holders uh, could only get lower or no surrender value. That was uh, the proposal which was put forth by life insurance companies. We need to see what comes as a part of the final regulations on this very important topic of surrender value. Right, Yash, many thanks for all those details. Now, Patanjali Ayurved and its managing director, Bal Krishna, have issued an unqualified apology to the Supreme Court. This came after the court issued contempt notices over Patanjali's misleading advertisements. However, yoga guru Ramdev has not apologized to the court yet. On to a CNBC TV18 exclusive, Akasa Air founder and CEO Vinay Dubey has ruled out liquidity issues at the airline. Speaking to my colleague Danish Anand, Dubey said the airline has an extremely strong cash position. He added the airline is looking to start flights to Riyadh and Jeddah in the second half of summers. He also expects Akasa to end FY24 in a growth trajectory that hasn't been seen in global aviation history. Take a look. I, I will say, uh, you know, two things in terms of finishing FY24. One is, uh, you know, financially and from a cash perspective in an extremely strong position. So that's the one thing, you know, I will say that we built this, you know, rock solid foundation when it comes to both the business model and when it comes to being capitalized uh, and cash. And that's one way we expect to end FY24. And the second way is, you know, in, in a growth trajectory that no other history in global aviation has ever seen. And the third thing is we expect to end FY. I know I said two, but I've got the third. We expect to end FY24 as India's most on-time and most reliable airline. Mahindra and Mahindra has signed a memorandum of understanding with Adani Total Energies to set up EV charging infrastructure across the country. The auto major has claimed that the collaboration will benefit XUV 400 customers who will have access to over 1,100 EV chargers. In a company statement, m and has also said that the partnership aims to boost EV adoption in India. A recent survey conducted by industry body FICI and the Indian Banks Association is upbeat about banks' asset quality improving over the next six months. The survey was conducted between July and December and covered banks, private, public and foreign, accounting for 77% of the banking industry by assets. The survey also revealed that when it came to fighting bad loans, public sector banks have done a better job than their private counterparts over the last six months. Meanwhile, inflation trends indicate that it remains under control. That's the word coming in from former Chief Economic Advisor K.V. Subramanian. Speaking to CNBC TV18's Abhimanyu Sharma, Subramanian also said that the country is doing well despite global headwinds. The number seems to suggest otherwise. 7.6% uh, growth has been projected. So, you know, um, maybe you might want to modify that question a little bit, that headwinds, globally headwinds, but I think India is doing pretty well. Credit infrastructure and I think credit growth needs to uh, increase significantly, especially for investment purposes. Um, and I think this round, we uh, will hope that credit creation happens without some of the problems that we had with, you know, uh, crony lending and, uh, you know, um, some, of the, uh, um, some of the bad assets that were created. On to a CNBC TV18 exclusive, the GST Council is likely to prioritize rate rationalization process when it meets post-general elections. Sources tell us that discussions on a three-slab structure will start when the Council reconvenes in July. Timzi Jaipuria joins us now with the details. Timzi, um, what are your sources telling you at this point? Well, that's right. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that rate rationalization is likely to be the top priority for GST Council in the coming fiscal. And as we speak, GST Council is likely to begin discussions moving to three slab structure 
as the next phase of GST as soon as we kick in in the next fiscal. GST slab changes are likely to be done keeping in mind the overall tax incidence and sources say that the list of items in 28% GST slab are likely to remain as is but when it comes to items in the slab structure of 5%, 12% and 18% that uh, particular slabs may see change or correction. Apart from that, correction of inverted duty structure is also going to be a crucial part of the discussion when it comes to the rate rationalization talks, which will begin once the council meets. And why now? Because government is now confident of achieving 1.8 lakh crore rupees as monthly average. And thus, this gives confidence to the government that, yes, rate rationalization can actually see the light of the day, and especially moving from a four to a three slab structure. GST collections are stable, and that's what helps the government. Apart from that, group of ministers on rate rationalization is also likely to meet only once general elections are over. Remember, group of ministers on rate rationalization is now under the chairmanship of UP's finance minister. However, it has not met since the time of reconstitution, that is November 1st, 2023, when the group was reconstituted. Also, just to remind our viewers that GST Council is likely to meet only after the new government takes charge and the group of ministers on rate rationalization has members from UP, Goa, Bihar, Rajasthan, West Bengal, Karnataka and Kerala. So let's see uh, what is in future of GST, especially when it comes to the rates and moving to a three slab structure. Back to you. So we'll, wait, we'll have to wait and see what happens post the elections. Thank you so much for all those details, Timsey. Now, the Supreme Court has refused to stay the appointment of two new election commissioners. The court, which heard pleas challenging the constitutionality of the new law on election commissioners' appointment, observed that a stay will cause uncertainty ahead of the general elections. However, the apex court questioned the government's staring hurry. Ashmit Kumar is here with more. Ashmit, take us through what transpired in court. Well, there are two sides to this story. The first half, what happens on the appointment of the election commission? We have two new election commissioners. On that question, the Apex Court gave an unequivocal answer that there is no scope for it in terms of uh, striking down their appointment. That will not happen. That happens only in exceptional circumstances. The Supreme Court defended its position, saying that the elections are around the corner. This was called. This will cause complete chaos. So, on that front, that question has been answered in the negative. Uh, the election commission appointments will continue. But on the other side, the process of appointment did invite a lot of scrutiny from the top court. The Supreme Court said that even if we let go of the question of the independence of the election commission on account of uh, the way the collegium and the selection panel is currently structured, there are still questions uh, with respect to how they were appointed this time around. Uh, the question that was asked to the center is what the tearing hurry was. Uh, the Supreme Court asked a very pointed question, in fact, that there were as many as 200 candidates in question. The fate of those 200 candidates, they were narrowed down to just two uh, commissioners in the space of just two hours. Uh, the question that was asked is that how can a selection panel, uh, they are required to examine all the candidates, how did they go through this entire exercise through application of their mind in just a space of two hours stretching across 200 candidates. So some serious questions being asked, questions being asked as to why the date was advanced in a way as it would uh, defeat the hearing before the apex court altogether. So some tough questions there, but the larger question with respect to the appointments, uh, they are likely to continue. No change there by the Apex Court. So no change there by the Apex Court. Thank you so much for those details, Ashmit. Uh, now, the Supreme Court has stayed the government's notification on the fact-checking unit. The court has observed that the rules, which have been enabled by the amended IT rules, raise serious constitutional questions. The court has ruled that the rules shall not be operative till the Bombay High Court takes a final decision on petitions challenging the amendments. State Bank of India files a compliance affidavit after a rebuke by the Supreme Court in the electoral bonds case. SBI says it has submitted all the details, including the unique codes that will reveal the link between buyers and the recipient political parties. The Election Commission has released the data on its website. The Supreme Court lashed out at R.N. Ravi, Governor of Tamil Nadu, for refusing to swear in DMK leader Ponmudi as a minister despite a stay on his conviction. The court gave the governor 24 hours to reinstate the minister and orders him to act as per the constitution. Election Commission has ordered the union government to stop sending a letter by Prime Minister Modi to people on WhatsApp through an account called Viksit Bharat Sampark. The EC has ordered the government to file a compliance report immediately. The move comes after opposition parties accuse the government of violating the rules by sending these messages to the public after the model code of conduct took effect. The Congress top brass has hit out at tax notices. The party, while addressing a press conference today, said that the Income Tax Department has sought details from an assessment year 
three decades ago when Sitaram Kesri was the treasurer. Sonia Gandhi, who made a rare, rare appearance, alleged that a systematic effort is underway to cripple the Congress financially. BJP President Nadda responded on X saying, and I quote, the Congress is conveniently blaming their irrelevance on financial troubles, end of quote. Systematic effort is underway by the Prime Minister to cripple the Indian National Congress financially. Funds collected from the public are being frozen and money from our accounts is being taken away forcibly. The electoral bonds have benefited, as everyone knows, the BJP hugely, massively. <clears throat> On the other hand, the finances of the principal opposition party, the Indian <clears throat> National Congress, are under a determined assault. Aapki party appeal mein gai, aapki party ITAT mein gai, aapki party high court mein gai, aapki party supreme court gai hai. Aapne kya chupaya? Aur jaisa hamne bataya, income tax mein is baat ka pravdhan hai, ki agar आपके पास ड्यू है आप ड्यू नहीं देंगे तो रिकवरी में आपका बैंक अकाउंट फ्रीज हो सकता है The BJP has released its latest list for the upcoming general elections and this time it's featuring candidates from Tamil Nadu. The state's BJP chief K. Annamalai will contest from Coimbatore. Tamil Saik Saundarajan, who resigned as the governor of Telangana on Monday, will be fielded from South Chennai. Meanwhile, former union minister Pon Radhakrishnan has been nominated by the party from Kanyakumari. ED officials reached Arvind Kejriwal's residence hours with a search warrant after Delhi High Court refused to give him interim relief in the excise policy case. The court refused to pass any orders for no coercive action by the Enforcement Directorate against him. Kejriwal skipped ED summons in the case nine times. Coming up on India Business Hour, on the eve of the Indian Premier League, MS Dhoni steps down as the captain of Chennai Super Kings. Opening batter Rutaraj Gaikwad has been named as the new skipper. And you can also catch all CNBC TV 18's news and updates on Facebook, X, Threads, Instagram and Geo Cinema. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour. More than 100 Palestinians killed in Israeli attacks in the last 24 hours. Overall death toll near 32,000. U.S. unveils a new draft U.N. resolution seeking immediate ceasefire and release of hostages. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is touring the Middle East once again. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachud has said that the Supreme Court wants to set an example as an equal opportunity employer. In an interview with Network 18's Ananya Bhatnagar, Justice Chandrachud highlighted that the new Supreme Court building will be a welcoming and secure workplace for women. Take a look. Uh, the accessibility survey which we carried out was uh, in pursuance of a decision by me to constitute a committee on uh, promoting access and inclusion in the Supreme Court, particularly with regard to the rights of the differently abled persons and bearing in mind you know, the broad principles which have been set out in the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act of 2016. The committee was chaired by a judge of the Supreme Court but equally significantly, if not more, we had stakeholders drawn from the community whom we are supposed to subserve, serve. And as part of the report, uh, there have been wide-ranging uh, recommendations, recommendations which we are implementing at different layers. One layer would be in terms of physical accessibility. But going beyond physical access, there's the issue of, of course, providing real-time access to the services which the court system provides to people across the board. So we've been working very seriously on that. Uh, the government too has sanctioned almost 800 crores for the expansion at the topmost of the country. Uh, what would be the future of you know more accessible Supreme Court building and when this expansion happens, what more steps are in mind which are yet to come out in, 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 in the operation for, for that? In designing the new building which we are about to commence construction of, the object has always been to, provo to provide stakeholder access. 
what are the more measures that would come out for especially for women and especially for pregnant women because we see a lot of lawyers have to leave their practice when when they are pregnant or when they are uh, expecting at that point of time you know uh, ananya one of my uh, concerns really is that while more and more women are entering the legal profession the rate of attrition of women once they join the legal profession is high and that is something which we have to arrest uh for instance when you look at the recruitment of district uh, judiciary at the at the lowest level the first level in the indian judiciary or oh, in some states over 60% to 70% of the new recruits are women so we have to therefore create a very safe welcoming and uh, and secure workplace for women uh, whether it's in terms of having creches for women with children for lactating mothers which we have in the supreme court uh whether it's in terms of creating a bar room for women we have placed a great deal of importance on creating these facilities for for litigants for for women in particular and for for pregnant women for senior citizens Mahendra Singh Dhoni has resigned as the captain of defending IPL champions Chennai Super Kings. He has passed the baton to Rituraj Gaikwad. The announcement of his resignation as skipper came a day ahead of the start of the IPL. This caps a glorious captaincy career that saw Captain Cool lifting the trophy five times. Dhoni has led the CSK since the start of the IPL in 2008, except for a brief while in 2022 when Ravindra Jadeja took over. Dhoni, however, will continue to feature in the squad. India sports industry witnessed an 11% growth in 2023 raking in revenue worth 15000 crore rupees this as per a group m report cricket of course takes the lion's share group m's head of sports vinith karnik spoke to network 18 about the key factors aiding the sports economy take a look when we talk about legacy in the making of course much depends on how the economy of indian sport has been unraveling itself So can you talk a bit about what those gains are in specifics in terms of you know what kind of numbers are we looking at why only look at uh, look at uh, sponsorship uh, we all know that uh, today the title sponsor of indian premier league is paying 500 crores but look at it from a broadcast and streaming perspective okay uh, i think the previous right cycle got a 6400 odd crores 16400 odd crores yeah uh, for the five years right cycle uh the current right cycle which is on is almost got about 48 to 49000 crores right now that's a huge uh, uh huge gain right so that's that's in in line with uh, if, if there's a doubling of revenues on ground there's doubling of revenues uh, in terms of uh, media spends as well so just to put that into perspective okay last year is the first time we saw digital uh, advertising uh, growing as high as 40% maybe at a smaller base but it did grow at a at a uh, at a 40% base uh, now that's a that's a great sign right i mean today we all talk about a uh, digital india digital economy and that's somewhere linking back to sports as well and with that it is a wrap on this edition of india business hour many thanks for watching news continues right here on cnbc tv 18